All right. So, um, so let's start with the basics of bacterial genetics. Uh, now, in this, I'm going to assume that you have at least a general foundation on genetics, such as you would get if you went through intro biology. So I'm not going to cover the basics of genetics uh, that are true for all living things. Um, so I'm going to assume you know basically what DNA replication is and in general how DNA replicates what DNA is um, and how transcription and translation work. Uh, and I'm going to instead focus on what's different about bacteria and prokaryotes uh, as opposed to eukaryotes, since eukaryotes are usually what gets taught in those intro classes. There are some important differences between them. Um, so just a reminder, right after having said that I'm not going to do this, but this is going to be the only review slide here. Um, so there are four bases to DNA. Guanine, or G, pairs with cytosine, or C, uh, adenine, or A, pairs with thymine, or T, in DNA, and in RNA, the T, or thymine, is replaced with U, or uracil. Uh, these bases are part of what are called, uh, these are the nucleobase part of what are called nucleotides, which consist of the base, A, T, G, C, or U, a sugar, a five carbon sugar, either ribose for RNA or deoxyribose for DNA. You can tell that this one right here is deoxyribose because it does not have an oxygen at this two prime carbon right here. That's the deoxy part of deoxyribose. And third, they have a phosphate group, right? And all nucleotides have those three things. The phosphate's always the same, it's always a phosphate. The sugar changes depending upon whether it's DNA or RNA, and the base changes depending upon whether it's an A, T, G, C, or U. That is the monomer. When you attach many um, nucleotides together, you get a polymer uh, of nucleic acid, uh, deoxyribonucleic acid or ribonucleic acid. Uh, this attachment has a directionality based on the numbering of the carbons in the uh, sugar group, right? So starting from the oxygen, they are numbered one, two, three, four, and then five, which is kind of hanging off as a tag. And they're pronounced one prime, that little apostrophe after that is pronounced prime. One prime, two prime, three prime, four prime, five prime. And we say that the DNA strand has a uh, directionality to it. Uh, it is, it has a five prime end, which is the end that ends in the phosphate, which is attached to the five prime carbon, and it has a three prime end, which is the end that has a three prime hydroxyl group, which would be free. So this would be the five prime end, because that's the end with the phosphate coming off. This would be the three prime end, because that's the end with the five prime hydro or three prime hydroxyl coming off. And the DNA strand is a double-stranded, double helix, and it is anti-parallel, meaning that it's got two strands that run parallel to each other but in opposite directions. 
This one runs five prime to three prime that away. This one runs five prime to three prime that away. All right, review over. So, uh, in eukaryotes, uh, the genome is usually arranged in multiple chromosomes, which are linear, and mm, depending upon the organism, can be either haploid or diploid, meaning that haploid means that you have one copy of each chromosome, and diploid means that you have two copies of each chromosome. Prokaryotes, um, bacteria, and most archaea, but archaea are weird and variant here. What I'm talking about here mostly applies to bacteria, and archaea can be eh, a little bit more variable. Um, but either way, so bacterial genomes are typically circular, so they're still double-stranded. but they don't really have an end. They still have a directionality. Anywhere you look at one of these um, strands, it's gonna have a five prime to three prime direction, but because it's circular, circles don't have ends. Uh, bacteria are usually haploid, uh, meaning that they have only a single copy of their chromosome, or at least a single version of their chromosome. Um, so like your diploid, because you have 23 chromosomes, or 23 chromosome types, uh, but they're arranged in pairs. You have 46 total chromosomes, so you have two chromosome ones, and they're similar, but not identical. One might have the green eye gene, the other one might have the uh, blue eye gene, all right? Um, for bacteria, they usually just have a single chromosome, and uh, they usually just have a single version of it. Though sometimes they can have multiple copies of that single version, they will all be genetically identical, meaning that they'll all have exactly the same genes, um, the, at least barring mutations. The, the bacteria won't have a blue eye gene and a green eye gene because it's only got the one gene version. Uh, in eukaryotes, the chromosome is typically held in the nucleus. In prokaryotes, it's typically found in the nucleoid region, a non-membrane bound region in the bacteria. Uh, and it is uh, supercoiled but differently from ours. Eukaryotic uh, DNA is usually supercoiled by wrapping it around um, special proteins called histones. And so with the eukaryote, the genome is like wrapped around these beads and then the wraps themselves are coiled up. And then those coiled wraps are themselves coiled or strung out or something like that in a very well-organized fashion. And it's all, well, at least partially, mostly, um, done by wrapping around these special proteins called histones. Um, bacteria and other eukaryotes don't have true histone proteins, although they do have some proteins that kind of resemble histones. Um, but the prokaryotic genome is mostly uh, is mostly compacted by what's called supercoiling. Um, and at this point, I usually do a nice little visual demonstration, which isn't going to work very well. Um, but if you take any, you know, loop or circle of something and like twist it up real tight, 
and then let it you know relax a little bit you'll see that the 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 twisted portion will actually start wrapping up in a second twist that's super coiling and typically uh this the bacterial genome is compacted by super coiling um which is i don't want to say it's more disorganized but it's differently organized and it isn't quite as compact as your dna is um the uh both prokaryotic and eukaryotic genomes contain what is called chromatin chromatin is dna and protein in eukaryotes uh it's about 50 50 and uh, the protein is mostly uh, those histone proteins. In prokaryotes, it's still DNA plus protein, and it's still technically called chromatin, but it is less formally organized. As I said, it's super coiled um, rather than histone wrapped. Technically, they're both called super coiling, but um, uh, it is differently super coiled. And um, it doesn't contain those uh, doesn't contain those special histone proteins, though it does still contain proteins. So here you can see the genome of a bacteria supercoiled nice and tight within the cell. Uh, down here, this is actually a cell, a bacteria that has been exploded. And all of these white lines that you see coming out, all of that is its now uncoiled genome spilling out from it. And so you can only even see just a little bit of it here. And uh, that should tell you a little bit about how much DNA there is wrapped up in that tight thing. If you were to take the DNA in an E. coli cell, um, well, if you were to take the DNA in one human cell, one single human cell, and stretch it all out end to end, it would be about six feet long. It's pretty huge. Uh, bacteria, of course, don't have anywhere near that much DNA, uh, but they're also much smaller than eukaryotic cells. And as I said, their DNA is less compact than our cells are. Um, they still have quite a significant amount of DNA wrapped up inside of it. In addition to its normal chromosome, uh, bacteria can also have what are called plasmids. Plasmids are small, circular pieces of DNA. They look kind of like mini chromosomes. Some bacteria have them, some do not. Uh, Bacteria that have them uh, usually don't have to have them. Uh, plasmids do contain genes. They contain genetic information. Uh, but usually the genetic the information that they contain is optional. It's non-essential, by which I mean it doesn't contain any genes that are necessary just for the bacteria to do the basic functions of life. So, like, you wouldn't find the gene for... Uh, you know, um, for breaking down, sh uh, uh, or you wouldn't find a gene for um, glycolysis on it because, like, bacteria pretty much have to do glycolysis, so that's not optional. Um, but you might contain, you might find things that help you live in specific situations. Um, like, they're very, very important if you find yourself in those situations, and otherwise not. Um, or uh, genes that help a bacteria do something that might help it uh, survive a particular um, incident, or that might help it live in new places, or that might help it become a better pathogen, or might help it spread its genes to other things. Uh, these are all optional activities for the bacteria. It doesn't absolutely have to do them, but they do help it to succeed under the right circumstances. 
There are many different types of naturally occurring plasmids. Uh, some of the ones that I want you to know are there are fertility. These plasmids contain uh, the genetic information for making a pilus, which is the uh, structure that bacteria use to transfer genetic information, usually plasmids, uh, from one bacteria to another. We'll talk about them more uh, in a lecture coming up. Resistance plasmids usually contain uh, genes for antibiotic resistance or resistance to other toxic chemicals. Um, you know, that they aren't essential for the bacteria unless the bacteria happens to find itself in the presence of one of those toxic chemicals, in which case, yeah, you need it. Uh, virulence plasmids contain virulence factors, um, things that help the bacteria to become a pathogen. Uh, for instance, genes like a capsule or fimbriae or toxins or um, other things like that. Actually, toxins get their own category. Um, but the, so the last category that I want you guys to know is a bacteriosin plasmid. Um, this can contain the genes necessary to make and secrete toxins. Uh, some of those toxins might be toxin, toxic to us, uh, but much more likely what they're going to be is toxic to other microbes. Um, toxic to other bacteria or to fungi because those are actually the main things that bacteria are competing against. Uh, bacteria have been in the game of killing bacteria for a very, very long time. Being able to go out and kill your competitors gives them a significant advantage. Now, I said that these are the, uh, the types of naturally occurring plasmids that I wanted you to know, but you should also know that plasmids are used very, very frequently in biotechnology, right? So when we want to bioengineer a bacteria or when we want to put a gene into a bacteria, what we do is we put it into a plasmid and then we put the plasmid in the bacteria, uh, at least usually. And we can even go from there to, uh, uh, to having the bacteria transfer that plasmid into eukaryotic cells like plants or animals. Um, so uh, plasmids are very useful for bacteria. They're also really, really useful for us. Um, a lot of the, the biotech revolution of the past uh, 30 or so years has, uh, has, has occurred, eh, closer to 40 years, I guess, um, has occurred because of the use of plasmids and our understanding of being able to just construct plasmids. When a bacterial chromosome replicates, right? So bacterial chromosomes are circular, so it isn't like they can just start at one end and go to the other, all right? They don't have an end. But what they do have is what's called an origin of replication. Typically, a bacterial chromosome will have only one origin of replication. When the uh, DNA replication starts, uh, it starts at the origin. That's why it's called an origin. Um, and the strands will separate there. And then the DNA will start being replicated in both directions. Oops. So um, you will assemble one DNA replicating molecule, what's called a DNA polymerase, there, and another there. And then this one will go around that way. And this one will go around that way. And this is called bidirectional replication. Each of these molecules makes uh, what's called a replication fork, which is where you have the old DNA there, and then you have new 
DNA coming off in a branch from it. That's why it's a fork, like a fork in the road. And I should point out that, um, you know, hopefully you guys are sort of familiar with this, but uh, DNA is replicated semi-conservatively. So like the old DNA has two old strands and each strand of new DNA will have one old and one new strand. Uh, the area that is defined by the two forks is called the replication bubble because it looks like a little bubble. And even if you just take a look through a sufficiently powerful microscope, which is gonna have to be uh, an electron microscope of some sort usually, uh, or an atomic force microscope, uh, but like not one of the ones we use in lab. Uh, but I, either way, like when you take a look at this thing, it actually looks like a little bubble there. And as this unzips on both sides, the replication bubble gets bigger until eventually the two forks meet on the other side and twist off and you have two chromosomes now. Um, now, uh, remember how I said that the bacterial chromosome was supercoiled? Uh, and if it's supercoiled, it's all tightly wrapped up and the, um, the DNA polymerase enzymes actually can't unwind it in that state. So you have a little guy who runs a little enzyme that runs slightly up in front of the, uh, the fork on each side and unsupercoils the DNA. Uh, and then a similar one that runs behind it on each of the new strands and re-supercoils the DNA. So you have this like moving unsupercoiled area where the actual replication takes place. And that enzyme is called DNA gyrase. And it's important because it is one of the things which is different about bacterial uh, replication from us, and it's therefore something that can be targeted with an antibiotic. Plasmids actually replicate differently from chromosomes. This is one of the things that makes plasmids plasmids and not chromosomes. Uh, the other is their size. They are significantly smaller than a bacterial chromosome. But um, but they have this different origin of replication as well. Uh, what happens with a, a plasmid is they still have something that's called the origin, but it works very, very differently. Uh, it's gonna be unidirectional replication. What happens is you get a little nick. Sink. A nick is where you cut one, but not both of the strands of DNA. And so one of the strands of DNA will start peeling off and uh, that's going to cause this to rotate and as the inner strand rotates uh, a new strand is made next to it and as the um, this old strand peels away Right. Depending upon the mechanism, it could either stay single-stranded for a while, or it could have its second strand just synthesized onto it as it peels off. And this is called rolling circle replication. And here you can see it kind of in action. So this is the strand that's peeling off. And as this inner circle rotates, a new companion strand is made for it as it moves by this guy right here. And as this strand peels away, a new companion strand for it is made by this guy right here. And then at the end of all this, you're gonna cut that away and the uh, and you'll have one basically circular normal plasmid, and one of them will be currently linear, 
and it has to be circularized before it is completed just by taking one end and attaching it to the other. But often, not always, but sometimes, uh, it's going to go through a pillus while it's still linear before it circularizes. Another difference between bacterial and eukaryotic genomes are how the genes are arranged. Um, eukaryotes have much, much bigger chromosomes than bacteria do. Uh, eukaryotes also have many more genes than bacteria do. Uh, however, it's not really proportional. So our, um, uh, our DNA, we might have like a thousand times as much DNA as bacteria do, uh, but we might only have like, you know, 50 times as many genes. Now that's gonna mean that we have a lot more empty space than they do. Bacterial chromosomes are typically pretty packed. They don't have huge swaths of empty space, and their genes are relatively uniformly distributed. So if this was a big section of bacterial DNA, and these tick marks here might be where genes are located. So you see there's genes located down sort of the entire thing, and they're you know, they're not perfectly evenly spaced, but they're relatively evenly spaced, so that no matter where you hit here, you're gonna have about the same number of genes. Uh, the distribution of bases is also pretty constant. Um, different organisms have different, what we call GC contents, which is how much G and C you have relative to the amount of A and T you have. G, the amount of G and the amount of C always have to be the same because they're bound to each other, and same with A and T. But you might have some organisms that have like 70% of their genome is GC, uh, and other organisms might have 40% of their genome be GC. With bacteria, usually this is pretty constant. No matter where you look, if you look like, you know, um, if you look like here versus here, you're probably going to find about the same GC content. Maybe this is like 64% GC. Maybe this would be like 67% GC. But they're pretty close. They're, they're, they're pretty much going to be in the same ballpark, no matter where you look. With eukaryotic genomes, uh, what we have is genes that are usually clustered with vast swaths of large geneless, what's called junk DNA in between them. So here you can see this is a cluster of genes together, and then you have a huge area of no genes, and then you might have another gene cluster then maybe you have another uh, uh, another barren area. And the GC content may vary quite a lot depending upon whether there's whether or not there are genes in that area. So like here, you might have 64% GC. And whereas here, you might have 50% GC. So, um, genes themselves are arranged differently in uh, the bacterial chromosome versus the eukaryotic chromosome. And uh, we call this, uh, and well, okay, back up a little bit. Um, this is at least partially because um, genes are regulated and controlled differently in bacteria versus eukaryotes. And I'm not going to get too much into how genes are regulated and controlled. If you're super interested in that, take a genetics course. It's really fun. Highly recommend it. 
um, but a little bit beyond the scope of what we're going to talk about here. But um, the reason these genes are distributed differently is because they're controlled differently. Uh, and the study of how genes are arranged and how they are controlled is what we call genomics. Transcription and translation uh, may involve slightly different machinery between the two, uh, but the basic steps of it are pretty much the same, right? So in both bacteria and eukaryotes, you have a molecule called RNA polymerase. Eukaryotes have a few different versions of this, but basically what it does is it's going to bind to the DNA, it's going to read off a section of it, and copy it into RNA. Um, both eukaryotes and prokaryotes have ribosomes that will take that RNA and read the code and translate it into proteins. Now, we have slightly different ribosomes. The ribosomes are different sizes. Um, they are regulated in slightly different ways. Uh, they bind to the RNA differently. They have different attendant proteins. The basic logic behind, behind how they work is going to be the same. They read the RNA three bases at a time. The three bases of RNA is called a codon, or sometimes a triplet. Um, and then they're going to have a little linker thing called a tRNA that binds to the codon and brings in a specific amino acid that will become the next amino acid in that protein. However, there is one important distinction between prokaryotes and eukaryotes that I do want you guys to know. Um, and that has to do with the fact that eukaryotes have a nucleus and prokaryotes do not. Transcription is the process of copying DNA into RNA. In eukaryotes, it happens in the nucleus. In prokaryotes, it happens in the nucleoid. Uh, in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes, it isn't like you just have a, a, a section of you know, DNA and one thing will come by, travel down, and then fall off. You don't ever just need one RNA copy. If you're going to make a gene, you want to have hundreds of transcripts, hundreds of copies, so that you can make proteins relatively quickly. And you don't make them just one at a time. It, it's like an assembly line, right? If you've got an assembly line that's making cars, you don't like start off and make one car to go. And the whole car goes all the way through the assembly line until it gets to the end and then you start a new one. No, that's not the way it works. You got cars going through every step at every process. So if you were to take a look at the DNA of, again, either a eukaryote or a prokaryote, what you would see is uh, in any actively transcribed gene, some RNA polymerase is going to be kind of near the end and have a big long transcript coming off of it. Some is going to be right at the beginning, just getting started. And then there will be several other ones in intermediate stages. Right. That's the same in both of them. In both of them, you also have the same thing happening in translation, right? Uh, in both eukaryotes and prokaryotes, you can have multiple ribosomes transcribing or uh, translating the same transcript at the same time. However, in eukaryotes, the translation happens in the cytoplasm. The transcription happens in the nucleus. These are separated and they cannot happen at the same time to the same molecule. You can't have a piece of RNA being translated while at the same time it is being made. In prokaryotes, 
there's nothing stopping that from happening. All right? So this, this is the same in both, right? You, you ha could have, like, lots of ribosomes on a, uh, on a transcript, right, at different parts. Now, here's what's different. In a prokaryote, because there is no nucleus and there's nothing stopping the ribosome from getting right up next to the DNA, you could have, and I'm going to do DNA, DNA here in black. And I'm going to do RNA in red. And you could have like multiple um, RNA polymerases. Going down, making RNA at the same time. That's what we saw in the last slide. No problem there. But you don't have to even wait. You don't have to wait until the transcript is finished before you start translating it. And I'm going to do uh, uh, ribosomes in green. All right? So, like, you could have a ribosome that gets started right here. even though this transcript is still being made. And it isn't just there, you could have multiples of them. Making protein while the strand that's being made into RNA it is still going on. And you would have that on all of these as well. And of course, the farther the ribosome has translated, the more protein it's going to have coming out of it. And I'll do protein here in blue. So this will have a big long, or no, sorry. This will just have a little bit coming out. This will have a little bit more. like that. So this would be in a prokaryote. Whereas in a eukaryote, you have a nucleus, a cytoplasm and your DNA is in the nucleus and you could have, you know, various stages of RNA being made there. And in the cytoplasm, you could have your completed mRNA with various stages of protein being made on it. But this has to finish off and be transported out before it can be translated into a protein.
This is called concurrent. which means at the same time. Transcription. Translation. All right, so that's the basic differences in how the um, uh, how the genomes uh, and DNA replication, transcription, translation work.